Open your cerebral cortex and shift your lobes into upper beta phase because you are going to have Bitcoin knowledge transmitted directly into your vestibulocochlear. Your host at Bitcoin Knowledge is Trace Mayer, an early Bitcoin advocate since it cost a quarter, but this is not intended to be investment advice. A doctor of jurisprudence, but this is definitely not legal advice. And an investor in core cryptocurrency infrastructure, including Armory, BitPay, Kraken, and Mitagio, but this is not a recommendation of those services. Here, you get fed via direct mind download with pure and free Bitcoin knowledge. Welcome back to the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast. We have a legendary interview this time around. To start it off, I'd like to just read from Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper on Bitcoin. In section four on proof of work, to implement a distributed timestamp server on a peer-to-peer basis, we will need to use a proof of work system similar to Dr. Adam Back's Hashcash. With us today and for the rest of the week in five distinct episodes will be Dr. Adam Back. Dr. Adam Back, thanks for everything that you've done for Bitcoin, for your legendary service in the virtual currency and private cash arena over decades. Uh, welcome to the podcast. Hi, good to be here. So how how did you get, like, what's, what's some of your background? Like, what's this... Uh, PhD in distributed systems. What's some, some more of your background in this uh, virtual currency and private cash space? Yeah, so I did a PhD in distributed systems, which is about algorithms for consensus systems. And I guess many people heard about the Byzantine Generals problem in the paper by Leslie Lamport for the first time, you know, via the references in the Bitcoin white paper and the exposure and use of consensus systems they're also used in decentralized databases for sort of uh, consistency models. So I was researching in uh, sort of parallelizing compilers and um, using technology from discrete event simulation, which is sort of optimistic execution where you speculatively try execution and then if it goes wrong, you, you prune it and roll back. And uh, there are kind of a micro level components of that in CPUs these days, but at that time that was a kind of software level where you would basically take an existing sort of C++ software program and transform that into something that models the method calls in a message passing model. And as part of my PhD program, I got to know a master student who was trying to optimize the RSA encryption algorithm on a parallel computer because at that time, this is sort of back in 1995, so actually, sorry, 91 to 93, I was doing this. And so I, uh, he was trying to implement the RSA algorithm and find ways to parallelize it. And that's the kind of research I was interested in terms of how to, you know, make best use of a piece of parallel equipment with dozens and dozens of CPUs on a high-speed message bus and try to get the result as quickly as possible and make full use of the CPUs or the cores and sort of balance the communication overhead with the CPU overhead to, to get the result in the lowest time. So there's, there's a whole area of distributed computing about algorithms to do sort of parallel sorts and parallel RAM and execution of different kinds of algorithms in that way. So this, this guy... Uh, was um, working on that, and I took an interest in what he was doing and helping him figure out how to do this, and through that became familiar with the RSA algorithm. So then I, I got interested in that, and shortly after that, the PGP came out, uh, the first version by Phil Zimmerman, and was using the RSA algorithm, so I, I kind of got interested in that, and then the sort of you know positive social implications, implications for social change arising from cryptography and personal autonomy and rebalancing the sort of improving the balance of power between the individual and the state. And, you know, we start to see sort of effects of that more recently. Yeah. So I, I've, I've been, you know, particularly interested in that part of, of Bitcoin and asymmetric cryptography in general, uh, because I think it's changed the economics of violence, which is a, a tectonic uh, shift 
you know, and, and it's going to cause society to reorganize itself because it's changed those, those particular economics. But looking through the long corridors of history with man's struggle from the swamp to the stars, we've had our brightest minds, our brightest scientists ever, Dr. Well, Nicholas Copernicus with heliocentric theory, he also persecuted for it, also wrote a treatise on interest. Isaac Newton, you know, developed the gold standard in addition to Newtonian physics. As Shakespeare would say, kill all the lawyers, even, even the lawyers like Johann van Gutha, 90, 60 to 90,000 word work, uh, working vocabulary two to three times Shakespeare's working vocabulary, an absolute polymath uh, in everything, huge innovate, huge developments in botany and optics, IQ of 215, two, two standard deviations higher than Isaac Newton's IQ uh, estimated. Copernicus is estimated IQ 185. Uh, but Gutha in Faust Part Two, his magnum opus, published shortly before he died, he laid out all the negative consequences uh, that happen to a society when the monetary unit gets corrupted. The chief justice says, well, you know, it's not quite right, but I'll make it right. So it corrupts the law. And the commander in chief in there says, you know, a soldier asks not from whence it proceeds. So it ultimately, when we corrupt the monetary unit, it ultimately will lead to the political elites controlling the lives of the individuals in contrast to the individuals being able to control their own lives and financial destinies. The founding fathers of the United States, they firmly understood this because in Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1, it states that no state shall make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts. We also have in the First Amendment... Congress shall make no law regarding the freedom of speech or of the press. You, you mentioned Phil Zimmerman in your work uh, back with PGP. C- can you perhaps go into this? You know, this intersection of cryptography, law, and how you kind of played a role back then. Yeah, I mean it's it's very interesting. I mean one one telling thing is uh, back then there were various countries that uh, tried to legally control or prohibit access to encryption for you know individual users, and you know over time, uh, so which is very interesting because encryption is merely mathematics. Yeah. Right. Right. So so they're they're wanting to control the access to numbers. Of, of individuals. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, <laughs> is there it, anything that could be more despotic? I mean, what are we going to make illegal? The zero? <laughs> so, um, the, you know, even, even major Western governments were, were in the game. So at the time, the, well, yeah, the munitions act, right, right. So the U S government had a regulation against exporting cryptographic software, generally kind of blanket. And, it was an interesting development because it was a kind of power struggle between the user's rights to, you know, it's, it's interesting in a sense. So you mentioned the legal rights. So, you know, in, in law, in most of the countries involved in this dispute, even, you know, even Western countries, so France had some kind of export controls. The U S had export controls and other countries had various variants of that. Um, and yet their legal systems clearly state, you know, the rights to, free speech and the rights of association, freedom of association. And yet, you know, in the internet age where you're communicating with people remotely, your actual rights to exercise those, you know, your ability to exercise those legal rights is very flimsy unless you have uh, cryptographic means to assure that. And so it's kind of curious that society, you know, that the regulations and the government administrators were basically trying to control technology to prevent you exercising your rights. So it resolved itself after a while, basically because I think, you know, it, it became widely used and it became difficult for governments, Western governments to, to sort of handle the, uh, the discord in what they were saying, right? You have this right, but you can't have the technology to give you access to this right. And eventually that kind of got swept away as indefensible. But even today, you know, if you, if you go down the sort of pecking order of countries, 
ranked by sort of press freedoms and you know religious freedoms and general quality of life on, on a sort of freedom from persecution of various factors. The, the countries at the lower end of it are still banning encryption or you know blocking access to the internet or filtering the internet and actually you know buying technologies unfortunately still from western company countries and companies in western countries to sort of either filter the internet or compromise and break into people's you know social media and webmail accounts and so forth well, and with quite drastic consequences you know people will be imprisoned or tortured or killed as a result of these things when like the united kingdom is a prime example if you refuse or or are unable to provide a private key that they assume but can't prove that right. you have, uh, they can throw you in jail. Right. It's kind of interesting in a sense also just from a basic logic that it's generally, you know, it's impossible to prove a negative. <laughs> and so <laughs> how do I prove that I don't have the key? I mean, you know, the, the joke at the time... Plausible this, deniability. Right. I mean, the joke at the time this was coming out, you know, some somebody on the UK cryptography discussion list said, well, okay, I'm going to send a big file of random numbers to the minister who proposed this and and, and report him as, uh, you know, and see, see how he fares, like proving that he doesn't have the key because you can't generally do that, right? I mean, not, not in a purely logical sense. So it's then really down to the court's discretion of whether they believe your claim that you don't have the key or not. I mean, isn't this a major problem that inferior minds have always wanted to persecute the world's brightest geniuses? Copernicus didn't want to publish about heliocentric theory, house arrest for Galileo. You could look in the freaking telescope and see that something was there. Yeah. Um, and yet, hundreds of years later, we're a pro-Copernicus society. Right. We're a pro uh, Newtonian physics society. Why would we want to be a pro cryptography society? And yeah. and was there is there a group or or kind of a an ethos that carries this banner of being a pro cryptography society? Yeah. So um, there's the cypherpunks list and various other people interested in sort of the social applications of cryptography and technology and internet communications and i think one of one of the things that people were thinking about with respect to cryptography and advancing you know the social norms and bringing the rights that we enjoy in the offline world into the online world is that you know you you could go about this through the legal and political kind of system and it might be quite slow because generally what tends to happen if you look back in history, is that society overcomes its prejudices uh, over time, and you know a number of people get persecuted and become test cases that end up overturning the thing, but it lags by like 50 or 100 years, so and, it's quite painful and, and slow. And they even, as we saw in the imitation game, they even persecute the very people that saved their lives. I mean, yeah. Alan Turing saved an estimated 14 million right. allied lives, and what did he get? Uh, he got castrated for it, yeah, literally, that's, that's, by uh, the UK government. Right, that's uh, horrendous. And uh, actually, the UK government, I think, uh, earlier this year or last year, um, issued a formal pardon. Oh, well, apology. thanks, yeah. to, like post-mortem. Right, you know? exactly. Uh, but he, he uses his brilliant mind and applies it to cryptography to save 14 million lives. Yeah. And those 14 million people decide that they're going to have him chemi chemically castrated. Right. I mean, it's just really kind of crazy yep so the the kind of philosophy that the cypherpunks uh, looked at this situation was you know we could try to lobby politicians and you know try to promote this in the press and go to charities that are kind of trying to fight for human rights or expand or improve rights within their own country but it would be a slow and uphill battle so maybe the way to change society is to just deploy the technology. And so in some way, the tipping point... Oh, you mean just uh, put the Gutenberg printing press out yeah, there and start a, printing books. <laughs> right, so it's, it's a kind of digital analog of that in a sense. So, you know, people were quite excited about PGP and interested to then, you know, so if you have the right to free speech, um, well, let's, let's provide, you know, anonymity technology or pseudonymity technology. So 
actually Hal Finney, who is somebody that was involved in Bitcoin quite early, coincidentally. Yeah, Satoshi he, sent him the first yeah, transaction. That's right. He he received the first Bitcoin transaction ever. I think it was like 50 Bitcoins, yeah. if I remember <laughs> what I read correctly. <laughs> Uh, presumably it had no nominal value at the time, but now that's, uh, you know, a thousand dollars or more or what have you. And so it was, it was the same guy, Hal Finney, who implemented the, uh, first remailer. So he just wrote it in Perl and it's a, a way for you to have privacy or anonymity via email. Um, so it's a simple piece of technology, but the, uh, they had this kind of mantra, uh, cypherpunks write code, which is to say, you know, you, you can go lobby all you want, but what, what ultimately changes the game is deployment of technology. And the idea encapsulated in that is that, you know, if society, if everybody is using a technology and sees no moral problem with it and thinks that's their moral right and this is the correct balance, eventually it gets to such a stage that it's difficult for society to punish those people because it creates a political outcry. So the idea is they deploy the technology help people do what they consider to be their legal right anyway, and then the legal system and the regulations and the governments will change more quickly. And, you know, it's it's probably the case, if you look at it historically, that things were changed by this kind of approach. You know, it's it's society... Yeah, yeah, nobody, forces... nobody asked for permission to... to... Right. For gunpowder or the Gutenberg press. Or, right. And it was after the fact, you know, you had to have a copyright from the king in order to print a book. But that didn't stop uh, the, yeah. the, 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 the revolution of ideas that happened in Europe. Yeah. So actually, I ran a remailer for a while when I was a student. And uh, that was a kind of, you know, contributed to the privacy network, the kind of uh-huh. you know, uh, email connected peer to peer network that would. Uh, decrypt messages in a kind of onion route and so after that i got interested in you know electronic cash which was the other hot topic back then with um, dr david chorm's blind signature so while i was supposed to be researching distributed systems i kind of took a couple of years sidetrack into all kinds of advanced cryptography and so i uh, read all the academic papers i could get my hands on and uh, implemented a number of things so david chorm's blind signature was a start of, uh, it's kind of the you know or- originator of the electronic cash concept with blind signatures and cryptographically assured fungibility. So the interesting thing there is that you know you could you could withdraw a coin from uh, the electronic bank and you could spend it at a merchant and a merchant could deposit it and the bank even with collusion with a merchant wouldn't be able to correlate that you were the person that bought this and that, that the kind of concept would be you know if you're buying an electronic book a, a pdf or something there shouldn't be a kind of dossier of reading habits i mean this, this is generally frowned upon we saw we saw what happened when uh when in in germany yep you know based on what people's reading habits were yeah so it's a general problem that actually society usually fails to recognize the danger inherent in collecting information or that governments collect information ostensibly for one reason and then there's a kind of mission creep where they end up using it for increasingly unrelated things that you know if if they had asked in a vote for permission to do it would have been rejected and actually often the things they're using it for are flat out illegal but not discovered till after the fact and you saw a bunch of this with the snowden disclosures which were really eye-opening and kind of reset the game in terms of people's perception of privacy you know, and, and, and we're assuming the integrity of the voting what yeah. if, vo- <laughs> if voting made a difference it would be legal yeah. and i think it was was it stalin it doesn't matter who votes it matters who counts the votes <laughs> <laughs> well that's, that's sadly true in today's world i mean that's why there are all these kind of non-profit organizations uh, that try to go in and assure votes in sort of countries with where there's political turmoil so so out of this ethos uh of wanting you know, cypherpunks write code. I, when I was on the Colbert Report, the, the way they introduced it was, you know, the 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 dwarves they they dug too deep to find mithril, and really what they did was they released Durin's bane. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, they released the ball rock. Is that what you guys have finally done? Have the cypherpunks finally released Durin's bane with well, Bitcoin? Maybe. I mean, the, it's, the it's ability not- to transfer value. Over a communications channel, it's it's certainly a, a heyday for cypherpunks. I think people who were involved in in the cypherpunks are 
you know, e- extremely happy that Bitcoin has materialized and, you know, spent a lot of time back in that time, back in the sort of late 90s, trying to understand how to deploy eCash. And that was always viewed as a kind of holy grail of, of this uh, sort of privacy technology. You know, if you had the ability to communicate anonymously, you should also have the ability to transact anonymously. And so it was in that context that Nick Sabo proposed smart contracts. And so he has, a, I think, a law degree and a computer science degree and sort of put those two things together and looking at electronic cash, thought of the idea of kind of having a computer mediated contracting that could preserve anonymity or pseudonymity or privacy, or at least keep the information disclosed to be point to point between the contracting parties. So the concept of smart contracts dates, I think, way back somewhere in the 1995 uh, time frame. And so in operating remailers, you know, one of the problems you have with that is sort of uh, denial of service where people would send spam and junk through the remailer. And the suspicion was they might have been doing that to try and discredit remailers because they didn't like remailers or anyway, there was no kind of control. And so, you know, I was operating this remailer and obviously this kind of thing happens. And I was researching sort of some functionality and properties about cryptographic hash functions. And, you know, there's... You, I could see that there was a way to, there was, there's an opportunity to find a solution. You know, so if you could, if you could provide, if you could find a birthday collision to, at the time it was an MD5 hash, it would be an insane amount of work. But when you finished, anybody could verify it instantly. So I was thinking, okay, there's, there's a very large amount of work and there's something that could do with a denial of service protection. Maybe we could scale the work down so that you could make different sized amounts of work. So then I designed, hash cache using that building block and simplified it in a few ways. And so that, that then became a kind of digital postage stamp. I knew the original idea was to use that for remailers so that you could, you know, so there'd be a small cost sending a mail so that people wouldn't just flood junk through it kind of thing. And it was also used for a number of other things, you know, for paying for pseudonyms and using sort of uh, some email systems. And uh, I think it's used in the SFS file system, Microsoft ended up using it in uh, their kind of mail ecosystem, hot, Hotmail, and so the, the Hotmail system, the Outlook mail client, the Exchange mail server. So they they have a variant of Hashcash, and there's an open specification for that. And Hashcash itself, as a kind of anti denial of service stamp, is supported by various kind of uh, mail filtering systems, like uh, Spam Assassin uses that. So it kind of, you know, if you have a, a hash cache stamp on your mail, it reduces the chance of being falsely categorized as spam. So it improves reliability generally. So after that, I, I went to work f- for Zero Knowledge Systems, which is a Canadian startup that was trying to build Tor. And, and what is Tor exactly? Uh, so Tor is, um, privacy technology for browsing the, browsing the web. So the remailers were for email and Tor is, kind of that kind of technology, but browsing the web so that you can, you know, maybe browse a website that's about a medical issue that you don't want the world to know about. Or just or a the, journalist could, yeah, could so submit and actually information. Also, you know, intelligence agencies also use Tor. They, they use it a lot. Right. And Tor itself, yeah. you know, was, uh, you know, some of the contributions and people researching and working on Tor are actually from the uh, U.S. Navy, I think, the Navy Research Lab. So anyway, at Zero Knowledge Systems, this was pre-Tor, and we built a network that was Tor-like in intent and developed a bunch of the technology. And actually, Tor uses some of the things I invented at that time. I think I'm cited in the um, Tor white paper I noticed a, few, a little while ago. <laughs> Good <laughs> gracious, cited in the Tor white paper, the Bitcoin white paper. <laughs> I, I, had, I had no idea. I guess I must have exchanged an email with somebody and kind of forgot about it. But, you know, it, it was in, in developing the... The network in uh, zero knowledge systems, which we called the Freedom Network for obvious reasons, um, <laughs> we we made some observations and discoveries and protocol innovations to provide robust privacy for real time communications. And there's there's a paper that I published with some colleagues as well about kind of security and reliability and privacy trade offs. So there's a kind of triangle between those two things where between those three things where you can only really robustly provide two and uh those is kind of an interesting observation and so i mean the the freedom network isn't doesn't really exist anymore the source code got released but you know several of the, d- the key designs and observations in it live on in tour so that's cool <laughs> so why why would such 
a legendary intellectual giant like yourself shift his time and his attention and his focus to Bitcoin, to this magic internet money? So the the, uh, legendary is kind of a... (laughs) Oh, come come on! Bitcoin has changed the world uh, by opening up people's ability to send value over a communications channel and have immutable persistence. And Tor has changed the world. And you're cited in the Tor white paper also. So, I mean... Like those are two legendary pieces of groundbreaking technology that has changed the world. WikiLeaks, how did they receive most of their of their leaked documents? It was through Tor. Um, you have definitely had an impact on millions and millions of lives, if not billions. So, I mean, maybe you're being too humble about your your contributions to the cryptography space and the distributed system space, but like, I don't think you are. So I mentioned earlier that I was interested in electronic cash systems. So I'd actually implemented the electronic cash and credential system by uh, Dr. Stefan Brands, who's actually the PhD student of uh, David Chaum. And uh, at some point during his thesis, he kind of fell out with David Chaum. And uh, actually, David Chaum declared, this is in a footnote at the back of the, about his thesis, which is a book that you can get online. Um, you can You can look it up and download the PDF that he thanks David Chaum for declaring that it was impossible to do blind electronic cash with discrete logarithms, which he went on to do and showed to be (laughs) more flexible than the RSA-based blind signature that David Chaum had invented. (laughs) So anyway, the the credential system that Stefan Brands created is very interesting, has very many interesting properties, and so I implemented a cryptographic library that implements that and David Chaum's Two and uh, spent a number of years also, you know, after the Hashcash protocol I, I released on the cryptography and cypherpunks list, there was some quite immediate sort of observations that this was somehow uh, like electronic gold or something. And people were then trying to figure out how to combine that in a decentralized system to build an eCash system. So Weidai, who had proposed B money. The way he put it is that he wanted to build an electronic cash system without a banking interface because the banking interface was viewed as a weak point. So, you know, with the DigiCash experience, this is David Chaum's company, they had stood up a demo system, but to actually, you know, buy the tokens you would need to interact, you know, you would need to to work with a bank to provide this service, you know, either to get a banking relationship or to have the bank operate it directly. And there, there was a lot of excitement and there was a potential of contracts with banks in the offing at that time with DigiCash. But they ran out of money, it went bankrupt, all the people who had the demo coins lost them. And so the realization was uh, that's like centralization is bad, we need decentralization. And so Hashcash was viewed as a way to, you know, um, avoid needing to interact directly with the fiat system. So it'd be more of a market system. And so the B money proposal proposed to use Hashcash to mine coins. And so it was a kind of outline of a system, vague in some regards, and not, not well defined enough to be implemented. And actually Nick Zabo, the, the same guy who invented smart contracts, made a, a related proposal quite similar to B money called Bitgold. And that talks more about ledgers and, uh, Byzantine generals, like, you know, that's it, if you're a computer scientist, you would realize that in a distributed system, you need some way to arrive at eventual consistency. So he'd explored that possibility. But Bitgold also kind of missed a number of features. He had a kind of indirect market mechanism to arrive at uh, price discovery and inflation control, whereas Bitcoin is able to do that algorithmically without human traders to do that. Uh, so both of those systems were proposed in 1998, the year after the Hashcash paper and following various discussions. And so there was a kind of ongoing discussion. And I spent quite a number of years in my spare time trying to figure out how to you know, make these kind of things concrete and see them implemented. I think if people had figured out, you know, specifically how to control inflation and to make these designs concrete, they would have rushed off and implemented them because that was the cypherpunks thing, right? Somebody like Hal Finney would have rushed off and implemented it or myself, you know. So you would have wrote code and released it. <laughs> yes, I mean, that's, that was the, the thinking, uh, you know, that, that the only way to affect social change is to write code and have people use it, basically. The people had kind of given up on the political system as too slow, uh, 
unlikely to affect change um, on a meaningful time frame. And so then there was a lot of, you know, research in how to do this. And I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to do this. And, you know, I, I tried to extend uh, Stefan Brand's electronic cash system so that it would be offline transferable. So the uh, David Chaum's system and Stefan Brand's system are so-called online e-cash protocols, which means when you deposit a coin, you really need to take it to the bank and deposit it. If you if you accept it offline without talking to the bank, it could get double spent. So the bank had the double spend database. So I tried to find a way to make the offline respendable, and I actually found a way to do that and uh, discussed it with Stefan Brands. And actually, as, as happens frequently in these kind of things, uh, it turns out somebody else had already invented that specific method. But at least <laughs> at least I discovered something kind of novel that you know just the timing issue. Otherwise, I might have found it. But it's still, um, it, it had some linkability in its offline use, but the linkability is actually quite similar to Bitcoin's linkability. So, and I think I might have contributed. So there, there were a number of people in the Cypherpunks list who were talking about designs, and some of them were anonymous because it's Cypherpunks and they developed the remailers, so they were kind of practicing their own technology. So there were some kind of jovial or joking comments from anonymous people. They're actually insightful, technical, cryptographic protocol comments from anonymous people. And of course, we don't know who they were. Potentially, some of them might have been Satoshi, right? Probably some teenager, like, tinkering around on a computer. Some of of them, like, there were some that could have been Satoshi. You know, they were, were like, related concepts. (laughs) Unless you're Satoshi. (laughs) Uh, No no comment on that. (laughs) Don't, don't like to speculate on who Satoshi might be. I, I, I think it's probably a good thing that Satoshi is anonymous because, you know, there's a lot of political pressure that could, yeah, could exactly. land on somebody who is seen to, to somehow have control or influence and, or something. And as Satoshi said, you know, these these cryptography will not solve our political problems. Yeah. You know, that's something we – our morality and, and ethics need to advance to the state of our – scientific understanding really yeah so i mean when i when i saw bitcoin well actually i received an email from satoshi i think in august 2008 to ask about the uh, citation and hash cash and uh, i actually pointed him at the reference for uh, way dies b money and as i think that is where the citation in the paper for b money came from because um, I didn't think at the time to also cite uh, Nick Sabo's mm. Big Gold, and that wasn't cited, but uh, B Money was. So I think if I hadn't had the interaction, that uh, it might that B Money might have been cited. The way the way that he just... <laughs> so you're teaching Satoshi about Bitcoin well, I mean, before I, he publishes I, 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 it. <laughs> I don't know, but I mean, at least he he seemed to be unaware of B Money, and he had some commentary about how it relates to Bitcoin, and also conversed after that with Wei Day about B Money. So you kind of you know. B money had the kind of idea of decentralized mining and just hadn't figured out the inflation control. You know, both Nick Sabo's Bitcoin and Way Day's B money had some kind of uh, more fuzzy inflation control involving humans and voting and some form of, you know, not exactly centralization, but people that would balance factors and do things. Whereas the trick with Bitcoin, and I kind of kicked myself afterwards when I saw. Because I tried, like, I really tried to uh, figure out how to do inflation control and I had this kind of mental blockage and, and failed to make the leap that Satoshi did where, you know, I was I was aiming for kind of zero dollar adjusted inflation. And that's very difficult to do, maybe impossible. Yeah. Whereas what, what Bitcoin and Satoshi did is to, you know, fix the supply function. So and then let the market decide on a price. So Bitcoin actually doesn't fix inflation. What it does, it has supply side inflation and then an adoption curve. And at, at times when the adoption curve is higher than the supply side inflation, you get a kind of deflationary price effect. So the price goes up. And so that varies. And the, the rate of supply side inflation, of course, is tapering because of the supply curve and the Bitcoin production. So, you know, my, my reaction on seeing Bitcoin was like first kicking, oh. <laughs> kicking myself for not making that leap. And, you know, there are a couple of, so the inflation control is one, kind of leap that Bitcoin made. And the other one is to sort of tie things together. It's a very interconnected design where the mining is is doing multiple things. You know, it's providing incentive, it's releasing the coins. So the releasing the coins was already there in B Money and Bitcoin. And and also in uh, how Finney made another system called RPAL, reusable proof of work, that would uh, was implemented using the TPM, so a piece of hardware that would sort of be hard to tamper with and provide uh, a sh- 
sort of signature assurance that the hardware was doing the right thing. So, so yeah, I mean, Bitcoin made a couple of leaps and put it together. And so I was kind of kicking myself for not seeing the inflation control thing, which might have got, got us there sooner. And also the, the second reaction was, you know, that the fungibility assurances in Bitcoin are kind of weak. You know, the, this, this degree of linkability and the lack of uh, cryptographic fungibility was a concern to me. So I, you know, once I got more actively interested in it, I started to try to apply the cryptographic mechanisms that, that had been used in previous electronic cash systems. So, for example, there was a 1999 paper by Sander and Tashmart, who is really mathematicians, which used a zero knowledge set membership proof. Uh, it's called Auditable Electronic Cash, the paper. And actually, I, I immediately recognized that this paper would allow Bitcoin to provide cryptographic fungibility in the same way that the electronic cash systems did. And so, and in fact, the zero coin paper cites that paper and is an optimization of it. And uh, so the other kind of advance in sort of fungibility technology since then is the SNARK concept, which is very recent, only a couple of years ago from Eli Ben-Sassoon at the Technion and the team there. And uh, working together with the original authors of the zero coin paper, they put out a zero cash proposal, which uses this SNARK concept, which is a very exciting, you know, kind of new computer science concept, which is the kind of digital signature analog of homomorphic encryption, which is the kind of software only analog of what TPMs can assure. So, and and we're actually going to talk about that in depth in uh, episode three, where we talk about your your one of your brainchild's uh, confidential transactions. Right. Yeah. So that that was the kind of fruition, one of the fruitions of uh, spending quite a bit of time over the last few years trying to figure out how to improve Bitcoin fungibility and use some <laughs> of the cryptographic things, you know, from the previous electronic cash systems and the cryptographic literature to improve Bitcoin and fix the fungibility and reestablish where you're at. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I felt kind of bad that, yeah. <laughs> so I was resolving to like, you know, crack some you're, useful problems. You're like, we, we are going to push this innovation even I'm, further ahead. Well, I mean, so, so the thing that the Bitcoin has, you know, so I, I talked also with Stefan Brands about Bitcoin and, and he had the same kind of reaction, you know, people who were familiar with the academic literature. And of course, he's the uh, kind of inventor of one of the, uh, most innovative electronic cash systems of the central server variety, you know, to, to say that the fungibility in Bitcoin is extremely weak compared to those guarantees, but, you know, maybe you can use a technology to, um, to improve that. And the SNARK system, I mean, the zero coin system does work, but it's, you know, the message size is quite big and there is also a, a trap door. So there's a kind of central trusted party that must create a private key and then promise to delete it. And if he kept it, he could forge mm. unlimited amounts mm. of coins. You'd be perfectly private, but you'd be able to forge an empty amount of coins, and that's a problem. So that's a kind of trust sort of setup problem. And the snark proposal tends, you know, there are different snark varieties, but you know, the more efficient one has also the trapdoor problem, plus the additional problem that the snark uh, kind of cryptographic primitive is extremely new. And so, you know, Bitcoin is using quite conservative cryptography that's been established for decades, and it's generally viewed as a bad idea to use bleeding edge crypto, even from top cryptographers, because the only way to really assure the security of these things is to have many experts analyze it and, think and try, to break, and try it. to break it for a long period of time. So unfortunately, you know, to directly use the, the snark mechanism for zero cash runs the risk that, you know, if there is a cryptographic break, somebody might end up with a bottomless wallet and there would be a huge amount of inflation creeping in before anybody realized it was being exploited or something like that. So, but the, the snark construct is very interesting. And I think there are some kind of short term things you could use it for, which are additive. So, you know, if, if you have an existing secure system, it can add an additional security assurance. So for example, you know, if the snark fulfills its promise, we'd be able to upgrade the so-called SPV or smartphone wallets to the same security assurance level as full node wallets through the magic of snarks, which is a whole other topic. <laughs> snarks, <laughs> kind of like catching snipes. Is this fun? Extremely. <laughs> Extremely. <laughs> We've had a, uh, a wonderful introduction to the absolutely legendary uh, Dr. Adam Back, cited in Satoshi's white paper, as we've talked about, 
we're going to be having a full week with him on the podcast discussing confidential transactions, side chains, and the Lightning Network, along with some of his other innovations and thoughts on Bitcoin and where it's going. So we'd just like to take the time to thank the legendary Dr. Back for being with us. Uh, you honor me too much. Thank you. Be sure to get a copy of the free Bitcoin guide at freebitcoinguide.com. Got a question or suggestion? Record your voice at bitcoin.kn. Don't be shy. To help the show, share bitcoin.kn with friends, post about it on Reddit, and otherwise spam the interwebs. Your iTunes comments and five-star reviews are very important to us. Please continue tuning in to the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast, where we release interviews with the top people in the Bitcoin world. Now take some choline and let that Bitcoin knowledge consolidate. <laughs> <laughs>